just say I got it. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Not on my screen. Uh, we're talking today about the history of the design of school. That is school. primary student and secondary school. I'm not talking about universities today. Um, my my the schools that I'm talking about are located in Australia, uh, but there are there are things that can be taken out to schools in other locations that uh, may be useful to think about. Uh, my apologies, this is somewhat long, uh, so I will try to move quickly. So the, the school, the idea is that the school shapes the child and the child shapes the school. The spaces of schooling have caught the attention of architects and educators for more than 150 years. And during that time, the role of the child within the school has moved from a person who's an engaged, a, a person into whom education was poured to an active participant in their learning, who's an engaged actor in the spaces in which they inhabit. From the earliest writings on school design, architects have sought to design the best environment for learning. But the role of architecture in schooling has not just provided an environment conducive to learning, but to represent schooling and school pupils to the wider community in particular ways. The school itself became an important focus and representation of society's expectations, a key public building that represented the tangible betterment of society through education of the next generation of citizens. Just put something up so that you can see this, but this is a university building. So I'm not going to be talking about university school buildings. Today, I'm going to look at the design of the Australian school over about a 100 year period, from the first introduction of state-based universal and compulsory primary education in the 1880s through to the 1980s. It demonstrates the changing position of the school, moving from institutions that carefully transitioned students from home to the wider world, through to democratic environments that encouraged and expected a level of citizenship and empowerment of the students there. From the mid 19th century, when the design of schools provided teacher focused environments in which students could be effectively taught, it was understood that the relative comfort of the child had bearing on their capacity to pay attention and the relative hygiene, air quality and light levels of educational spaces were important. By the mid 20th century, the concern was more about creating environmentally controlled, flexible, child-centred spaces and environments in which students could effectively learn. Changes to school design were not just a reflection of evolving architectural fashions, but demonstrate that pedagogy and design are closely entwined and reflect how, as the conceptualization of the child as school pupil has changed dramatically, so has the design of the spaces around them. So the idea of healthy children has strongly influenced the design of schools. And this is evident through a series of major texts written by architects who advocated the needs and requirements for well-designed and appropriate school buildings. Originally, the concern for health was demonstrated by a suggested amount of air space per child as the basis for classroom planning or the requirement for sufficient light and ventilation. As early as 1850, Henry Barnard was writing on the need for appropriate natural lighting and adequate ventilation in his school architecture uh, book. In 1874, E.R. Robson offered an international survey of school buildings within his book, School Architecture Being Practical Remarks on the Planning, Design, Building and Furnishing of Schoolhouses. Robson used German research to support his discussion of adequate lighting and seating ventilation and heating. These ideas were articulated regularly by experts advocating healthy environments for school, 
So by the early 20th century, school facades were marked by large expanses of windows that could be opened with accompanying passive ventilation systems. Physical exercise was also seen as important with experts recommending playgrounds and spaces for athletics and gymnastics, both internal and external. These requirements for appropriate light, ventilation and physical activity had a profound influence on the external appearance of schools and the way they were sited, particularly in the early 20th century. No other public building had this functional requirement of a surrounding set of playgrounds and other spaces for physical activity, nor did they need large banks of windows to illuminate each room appropriately for several dozen occupants. Internally, arrangements for students changed significantly away from fixed, often shared desks to individual tables and chairs that could easily be moved, along with that of the teacher, enabling flexible and changeable teaching and learning situations. A move away from formal and directional instruction to a classroom, and I quote, designed to facilitate the learning process, so arranged and equipped that pupils can work in groups and feel it fit, freely communicate with each other. So the history of the development of state education in the 19th century in Australia, across its various colonies, because of that in the 19th century, Australia was made up of six different British colonies, speaks to a society intent on providing educational opportunity for its coming generations. The instigation of universal primary, primary education was a significant social project, just as the multitude of school needed buildings needing to house such an initiative was a significant architectural undertaking. As the population grew, and as education expanded, new swathes of schools were built in the 20th century to accommodate the growing influx of students. The design of these new schools reflected changing social expectations and the role of the school in the community and towards its students. So today, I'm going to examine how different architectural trends suggest ways in which schools present themselves to students and their families, and how in turn they presented an idea as to what type of education they were aiming to provide. In this, I'm examining schools that were purpose designed by government agencies, and in the most part, new schools. Given the vast numbers of school buildings that were needed across the country from the 1880s onwards, it's unsurprising that state agencies responsible for the design and construction of schools developed standard types and approaches to suit educational needs, leading to a high degree of consistency within those jurisdictions. There are various factors that influence the design of schools, including the differences in philosophy and approach between various authorities in education. The architectural trends evident in school designs over time tend to transcend jurisdictional boundaries, indicating wider influences on them just then policy or bureaucracy. My research shows that there are clear and identifiable approaches to the idea of the school as a physical place evident across this period in Australia. So I'm going to examine this under four analogical themes that demonstrate both a chronological and a scalar progression. Firstly, the school as a house, Secondly, school as a civic building. Thirdly, school as a factory or from a factory. And finally, school as a town. These themes and the lessons drawn from this analysis are a reading of the architecture, not the pedagogical intent or ed educational practices within. From my position, buildings speak particularly in the context of the 19th century, by their choice of style. Style held particular associations, to the extent that different styles were seen as appropriate to the civic or public realm compared to that of the domestic or home realm. The scale, size and relative importance of the building dictated appropriate levels of decoration and stylistic choice. Warehouses did not look the same as parliamentary buildings. Modest houses were not dressed in the finery reserved for mansions. 
The very earliest purpose-built school buildings in Australia were often one or two room structures of little pretension, often built in the style and scale of a house. But there was a deep association between education and Gothic style architecture. The antecedents of modern school education being schools attached to monasteries, Christian monasteries and religious or origins of universities in the Western world, which was evident across the spectrum in Australia from the mid 19th century. We see it employed, the style employed in universities and schools alike. So here we are looking at the University of Sydney uh, of 1862, which is a Gothic revival building. Just, but we also see it applied to school buildings. This is the Dana Street National School in Ballarat. Now I have one more. Uh, we also see, it, to an extent in this example, a primary school in St Kilda. It's well known that as what is now regarded as the four pillars of state-based education in Australia, that is that the education is free, it is compulsory, it is secular, that is not religious, and under central departmental administration, were done on different timetables across the Australian colonies. The passing of the Forster Act in Britain in 1870 was a prompt for these colonies to consider regularising state education. Between 1872 and 1908, all colonies legislated to achieve these various elements, the provision of state-based education for all children aged between six to 13 or seven to 14. And the coming of state mandated elementary or primary education meant that school building had to rapidly expand in both size and number to accommodate the vastly increased population of school children. The earliest schools built under this new centralised condition were mostly in urban or city areas. In my state of Victoria, they were generally constructed of multicoloured brickwork and employed a refined Gothic revival style, including pointed arch windows and steeply pitched roofs that of course alluded to those antecedents uh, of the Gothic. But Despite such associations and an early uptake of the Gothic revival, the designs of school buildings soon moved away from it to adopt other styles. We could argue that the change in styles applied to schools was the result of changing architectural fashions, but there's something else going on. The new, new styles were a distinct move away from the religious associations of the Gothic to a more civic and thus more secular realm. The avowed secular nature of state schooling enshrined in legislation must have played a significant part in this. Yet if the physical embodiment of the Australian public school was moving away from the church-based uh, or religious-based to the secular, what was it moving towards? The origins of Australian schools, as I said, lay in modest, often single room buildings, not much larger than a house. This means that the idea of the schoolhouse, also reinforced by the small rural school, was in place in Australia before the advent of compulsory primary education. But as school education became a state provision, at least in urban areas, the school buildings were physically much larger and more imposing than the domestic house. So it's really surprising to see at the turn of the 20th century, to see a distinct move back towards a more consciously domestic scale for new buildings. These are just some of the 19th century school buildings that are like houses, you can see here. But then as we go into the 20th century, you can see that they are keep keeping or moving towards this language as well. So this is most evident in Victoria when there is a substantial increase in new school building from 1902. We see around 650 new schools built in the period, first 20 years of the 20th century. And we see a distinct change in the design of these schools, most clearly connected to a new school type, the infant school, which catered for the youngest school children. 
often built on the same site as an existing primary school. This was a discrete structure and the look and feel of the infant school was a modest building of distinctly homely or domestic scale. These schools were hall type schools, a type that's been developed in England and gained popularity in Australia from the turn of the century. They have a big uh, hall in the middle. You can see in this, uh, in the drawing, the one and a half story space in the middle, and then all of these small classrooms that are put around it. What's most significant here though, is that these hall type uh, schools did away with fancy entrances and steps leading into the doorways. And the doorways were scaled the size of a domestic house. Uh, and to give you an idea of the connections between the architectural language, this is what houses of that period looked like. Uh, so that's using the same language. And this is another hall type school. And there you can see the plan of it. The central hall with the classrooms around it, uh, with no corridors uh, and very modest entrance, entrances. There's the interior of the school. Another example, and you can see the doorways are quite small and low to the ground. Uh, in Queensland, uh, where the houses were, looked like this, you also see the schools looking the same. So they're using that home-based language uh, for the design of schools. This is quite a large-scale example of it. So the domestically inflected language of these schools promoted the idea as school as a transition point or a stepping stone between the house and the family through to the wider world. So the young children would go from a familiar place, a house, to a school that looked somewhat familiar. They were consciously more modern, modest and homelike than the primary school, uh, and it spoke to this transition point. The idea of school as a transition to the wider world, civic society, was evident in the architectural development of the higher levels of schooling, the secondary school or high school. Only a handful of states' secondary schools exist in Australia prior to the significant expansion that began around 1905 and gained much more momentum in the 1920s and 30s. Before this secondary education in Australia had been almost the exclusive province of religious or other private schools and their architectural expression uh, was dominated by religious denomination or the philosophies of the owner. The establishment of greater numbers of state-based secondary schools did not see the direct architectural emulation of religious grammar schools, but instead sought a consciously civic presence. Whereas the primary school of the early 20th century had looked to the house for its language, the high school instead looked to the realm of the civic building, such as town halls. In other words, the primary school was most clo closely aligned with childhood and the home, whereas high schools were aligned with participation in and becoming citizens in wider society. While primary schools of the early 20th century had not had formal entrances, high schools embraced them as a key point of difference, with classical porticos and porches to demonstrate their relative status. The giant order portico, a double-storey temple front, uh, is seen here, uh, no, not in this example, but is seen in the Box Hill High School, uh, was an exercise in genteel refinement and elegant embellishment. We also see that, that refinement appearing in slightly smaller schools, uh, such as the high school in Kyneton, uh, where my father went to, in, built in 1928 which used a Georgian style, but with um, those elegant columns across the front uh, to indicate its importance as a building. 
The choice of individual styles for these buildings seems to have been carefully calibrated to indicate the proper standing of the school within its local community and the level of education being offered. We also see it happening in other states. These school designs were communicating a fundamentally different positioning of the school within the community. The school had become a public building in its own right with its own typology. No longer was it overtly a transition between the home and the wider world for children, it espoused a civic presence. So as a ch child rose through various school levels, infant, primary to high school, so did the level of architectural pretension and sense of civic presence of the buildings that contained them. And the apex of this, the high school, spoke of its refinement and elegance of design. So we see this happening all over Australia. And even as we go into modernism, we see the same kinds of things, impressive entrances, processional steps up to embellished doorways. Uh, McRobertson Girls High School that you can see here uses a clock tower to uh, indicate its importance, even though it is using the most up-to-date modernist language. The same kind of civic presence is still being shown, even though it doesn't have classical porticos. And the connections here with the civic are very, very clear because it is modelled on Willem uh, Dudok's Hilversum Town Hall um, in, in the Netherlands. Just one more example. So I now want to move to the post-World War II period. And the impact of that war wrought significant change on Australian society, just as it did everywhere with no less impact on schooling and the design of schools. In architectural terms, the hiatus of war had firmly established a new austere and utilitarian style, modernism. Modernism was founded on the rejection of the past and embracing the new and progressive. So just as more traditional architectural styles had, had associated or inherent meanings, so too did modernism but its message was fundamentally different. Modernism was to be functional, fit for purpose, utilitarian, healthy architecture for all using newfound materials. It was a new universal architecture to shape a new world that could be applied in every situation. Modernism was deliberately machine-like, as though it had been delivered from a production line. Indeed, its origins have as much uh, from the utilitarian factories as the strident manifesto that distinguish early parts of that movement. The pressure at this time, though, significant material shortages, insufficient infrastructure, accommodation shortfalls, and rapidly increasing populations brought particular changes on the designs of schools. New school buildings had to be quick and simple to construct and make efficient use of materials. Although this example shows bricks, when this started, bricks were very in very short supply. Above all, they needed to be functional and efficient, utilitarian spaces that were fit for purpose and designs that could be flexible and accommodate growing populations. In the immediate post-war period, the new style was a timely solution for government architects to address urgent needs and shoestring budgets and was wholeheartedly embraced for schools and other types of community infrastructure. The idea of a standardised design for school was not a new one. Various state public works departments or architects branches had set up standard designs from schools from at least the turn of the 20th century, actually well back into the 19th century, uh, that were used with minor variation on multiple sites. This reached new heights post Second World War where standard building types like items off a production line were ubiquitous. In this vein, what we're looking at here is the design of the Victorian light timber construction type or LTC which was in production from the 1950s to the early 1970s. 
The LTC type, which began as reaction to uh, reaction to material restriction, ultimately became a form that could be rendered in various materials, including timber, stucco, and brick. It was functional in plan and section, enabled it to accommodate varying numbers of classrooms uh, to be standalone or in addition to a school. In plan, it was a double-loaded wide corridor, classrooms on both sides, with amenities at the end of the building separated by an open breezeway. In section, it was a single-storey building of two skilling roofs, each sloping away from the sunken flat roof corridor, which allowed for three sets of windows to each classroom. Uh, trilateral lighting became known. And we see these spread out across uh, multiple schools, both primary schools and secondary schools. I, I, my own school, my primary school was one of these designs. My secondary school had these designs as well. And I know Adele's kids who go to my old primary school may have seen this as well. Uh, so it's very, very common in Australia. They were very quick to construct, very effective in the use of materials and efficient in terms of cost with maximum amounts of space, so very popular. The LTC type might have looked as though it was an industrial product, but um, significant numbers of school buildings post-war really did come from factories. In 1949, the repurposed Bristol Aircraft Factory produced a prefabricated aluminium class block consisting of two classrooms joined by a small office. We see this, so you can see this is actually, this is a Bristol hut, but this is another type of prefabricated hut. It's the Ashwood High School. And these are the Bristol huts. I also went to school in Bristol huts. So I remember these, they were very hot, not very good. Uh, and they were seen as part of the accommodation shortfall for schools. To give you an idea, by late 1950, Victoria had ordered 490, New South Wales 100, uh, Western Australia 30, uh, and there were other types that were coming out as well uh, of various uh, British manufacture. So what we see are simple of this period are simplified building types using extruded sections. Uh, and we can see them right across the country from Queensland. Uh, they're all Queensland examples to Western Australia uh, and in New South Wales. Um, they all have commonalities and they have large banks of windows, plain surfaces, simple single roof profiles, and the common thread of the extruded section. Uh, mass production uh, as their defining theme, mass education is what they're doing. Gone is the idea of school as a monument to educational and civic aspiration that have defined the interwar schools. Instead, the school was conceived as a service to the ever-increasing masses of students entering the system, efficient, utilitarian, and standardised. So... With this, these extruded section type schools of post-war period, but repeating units could not stretch indefinitely across sites. They work well for schools of a limited size as a single building, but high schools usually require a significantly more accommodation to house their students. So there's only so much variation that can be managed in the design of school plans on sites for set size. <coughs> So what we see is that uh, larger schools of that period in the immediate post-war were often finger plants. Uh, I can show you where you have these parts stretching out as though they come from a hand like fingers. Uh, but the issue of flexibility and the efficient use of the site soon led to architects to consider different ways of achieving functional requirements. In particular, they started to consider the external spaces formed by the physical shape of the buildings as an important and in integral part of educational space and means by which physically large schools could appear less like a production line of endless corridors and classrooms. 
the increasing retention of high school students and the development of the comprehensive school in Australia from the 1950s and 60s saw a boom in large secondary schools, all over this primary school. Uh, larger schools meant more built space, but the, this did not mean larger single buildings. And there appeared to be a distinct aversion to making the high school building more imposing because of its increased physical size through the agglomeration of all of its facilities into one building. Instead, particularly from the 1960s onwards, there was an emphasis on the grouping of multiple buildings to become a complex or a campus rather than a single building approach. And so we see this uh, in efforts to design school complexes that accommodate large number of students for room for future growth. As much emphasis was placed on the external spaces, courtyards, niches, open expanses, as to the internal spaces as places of learning and socialization. Some included large semi-formal outside gathering spaces, including uh, platforms and vertical elements as a civic marker, um, the scattering of buildings with their anti-monumental character, the valuing of external spaces and a civic centre to the school emulated the village or town as though a cluster of houses around a village green or town square. Courtyard spaces were conceived as a sanctuary away from the wider world as well as a social space for the school. And so we see these designs where they have what are called donut blocks. Uh, you see this one here. Oh, these are scattered around in Western Australia. Uh, but the high schools with their uh, classrooms going around a, a central courtyard, uh, and one of them, this one, the donut design at Taramara High School, showing you the internalised courtyards. So these were consciously considered sites of gathering for the school. Uh, and the courtyard idea also found traction in Victoria. Show you there, that's a model school in, from Victoria. Um, uh, this was from the Education Architecture Research Laboratory. Uh, and that scene is really important. Uh, and you can see just some of the designs of these where the uh, focus the classrooms into these internal spaces uh, and then design of them. Plus the courtyard or town model designs for schools were also popular across the states. I'm not going to show you Mandura High School in Western Australia it was a series of blocks strung along a single extended circulation spine. I'm taking some of these out, but you can see that the grounds of the buildings surrounding the blocks themselves, often multiple stories, uh, become these important gathering spaces uh, for students. And that's really quite important to understand. Uh, that's the last one that I'll show you. Uh, because they're talking about the different way the school student is being conceptualised. So these trends in school design reflected those found more generally in architecture at this time with a distinct anti-monumentalism. It favoured an honest and robust use of materials that is exposed undressed timber, exposed concrete, brickwork, steel, glass and ductwork as a reflection of the grittiness of the modern urban condition. Uh, architects also demonstrate a significant interest in flexible and expandable building forms, plug-in pods, uh, service frameworks and network diagrams. Although the robustness of the materials and forms were fashionable, the exposed bricks, use of concrete and large timber sections in schools not only in, uh, brought about new aesthetic, but it was far more resilient to the battering meted out by exuberant school children rather than the lightweight modernist schools that had preceded them. In other words, they were tougher and less damaged. Uh, perhaps the slackening of strict discipline and the recasting of the school pupil as an active participant in their education required a more robust physical environment. The emphasis on a low-rise anti-monumental architecture in schools that consciously shaped flexible and social internal and external spaces could be regarded as kind of democratisation of the school as a place. School children as citizens 
ready for the outside world rather than proto-citizens still yet to be shaped. So I've set out not to examine pedagogy or educational theory or indeed the changing conception of childhood and adolescence in Australia, but to look at the changes in architectural form over that period. And this suggests there were significant changes to conceptualisation of the school student. So I've been looking at the messages carried by the architectural designs of Australian schools that show a clear progression from a careful positioning between home and the world in their earliest days through civic aspiration, mass production, to a kind of democratisation of school. And I'm going to finish on a quote. School architecture being probably the first building outside the home that will become totally familiar to the child is important in mediating outside society to its newest recruits. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Julie Willis, for the for the extensive reading of the school. Yeah? How the school in architecture, um, sorry, sorry, uh, school in Australia, move and change in time. All right. So now, uh, I will um open the Q and A session. I would like to invite all of you. Either you come here in person or in Zoom, if you have any question. I heard from Adele, where are you Adele? Adele's not here, that Julie have souvenir, right? What? For the souvenir, for the, yeah. for the, I've got, yeah, yeah, you've got that, two, all right. So two souvenir for the best question. So if you're interested in Melbourne Uni souvenir from Julie, please do ask. All right. So. Is there any question from all of you? Yes, please. Uh, yeah, you stand up and probably. Mic. Yeah. Yeah, uh, good morning, Mrs. Julie. My name is Madeline. I'm from architecture. So uh, the last sentence you said was really interesting to me because you said that uh, school is the place that will be familiar to the kids because that is the second place, like the, their second house. So how about architecture nowadays that you explain we are already, especially in Australia, we are already not in the term of uh, school looking like houses anymore. So uh, like nowadays we have lots of uh, like you know, mental problem and stuff with students. And I think that it's really important to make school, to create design in schools that will interpret, this is a homey, this is a safe environment. So have you ever done any like research or how, uh, or anything that interpret that maybe we should bring back those homey architecture back to school? Something so like that. It's Madeline, right? It's Madeline, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for yeah. the question. I haven't specifically looked at uh, whether returning to home environments uh, would be beneficial for schools, but uh, school design uh, does try to make uh, uh, schools friendly places, a place, and they think about how what the scale of the design is. So primary schools are often smaller environments than high schools. Uh, they think about uh, the size of the furniture. Uh, where can where can children uh, be children? Uh, and what is it to make sure that the uh, acoustics, the uh, the the types of things that the students can get access to, uh, feel familiar? Mm -hmm. But they are not home environments, and they don't try to make them exactly like home environments because they want students to pay as, as though they are in school. It's, uh, but this has changed a, a Inter big amount. I can show you that if we just go ahead some more, this is the old school room in the turn of the 20th century. And if we go to more into the 20th century, we get, teach learning spaces like this, <laughs> where students can be more empowered in what they do, that are spaces that they can in, engage in. So it is a distinct change, but it is not just we will make it a home. 
they are building types on their own. Okay, so they still have characteristics of a regular school. Like it's a, it's still it's still a different environment because it's school. It's a place for you to learn. So you, uh, for us designers, we cannot make it look one hundred percent like home because it is completely different things. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mandy, yeah. for the question. Um, I open the floor again. If you have any other question, or in Zoom, do we have um question in Zoom? All right. Meanwhile, Madeline, can you pass the mic to? Yeah. Oh, all right. We have another Actually, question back there. Can you please state your name for the question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning, Ms. Willis. Uh, my name is Farhan. I'm from Master Degree from Architecture Research. So based on what I've seen from your present presentation is that this the typology is uh, evolving. If yeah, there's an evolution from this in terms of scale, uh, so in the late I think 18 or 19th century, it tends to be a little bit small, but as time changed to 1950s or 1960s, if I'm not mistaken, is that the scale of the school is becoming larger and larger. So, uh, as if by based on my personal perception, is that the bigger the scale of the school environment the more aggressive uh, the students tends to be. So uh, I just want to make sure if that, uh, is it better to have a much smaller uh, school scale? Because uh, the I I believe that the smaller the scale of the school environment, the more controlled it is and the more uh, teacher able to control the students. Uh, is it true or not? Yeah, that's my own question. I think you are probably right, the correlation between smaller schools and uh, tighter control of, of behaviour of students. Yeah. Uh, but so in Australia, we have small primary schools and very large secondary schools. And the reason for that is to allow for a greater range of subjects to be, uh, topics to be explored in high school than primary school. Uh, and you couldn't be you couldn't offer that range of topics if you had small high schools and small primary schools. So from an educational point of view, they are they are arranged in certain ways, and then the architecture needs to uh, work with that. Uh, and so you can see some of those later designs are dividing the schools up into different places so that there are different uh, environments for school children to be in uh, that allows them to be who they are. Uh, and that's quite typical for high schools to have different scaled spaces to allow for different types of social interaction uh, for the teenagers who are there. Yeah, so is it possible that because of the curriculum is becoming more uh, complicated, it also affects uh, our royal perception of how school uh, really implies in, in terms of design right now? Uh, absolutely, yes. As it becomes more complicated, the greater demand for different and special spaces. But that's not a new thing. Uh, we go back to the early 20th century. They were, for secondary schools, they were designing specific bespoke spaces for, um, for different uh, types of study. So there would be a chemistry laboratory. You would not have a chemistry laboratory in a primary school, but you would have in a secondary school, and it would be a specifically designed space. Uh, library spaces are the same things, and you, you get uh, those bespoke spaces because of the curriculum. Oh, OK. OK, thank you. Thank you so much, Farhan, right? Yeah. Farhan, thank you so much, Farhan, for the question. Another question over there, please. Don't forget to tell us your name, yeah, because... All right. Um, good morning, Miss. So my name is Fabian, and I would like to ask you um, quite a fundamental question, actually. Uh, so moving on from the previous question, um, so as there is um, a more complex, more elaborate demand on how a school should be, is there um, 
based on the studies that have been conducted in the past, is there um, a particular design that is quantitatively better than the other? Because based on what I see, um, uh, all these studies are quite qualitative, right? So we're talking about a particular school for a particular demand. But as of right now, I feel like there's a need for um, mixed typologies for school because we have um, uh, mixed needs and times are changing, requirements are changing as well. So yeah, is there any, you know, a mix of things that's quantitatively better to use, you know, one more than the other? Thank you very much. It's Fabian, right? Fabian, okay, right. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, it's a big debate in school pedagogy and school design. Uh, and there are different things that come into fashion. From my point of view, school spaces need to be flexible and so that they can be reconfigured to do different things depending on how the teachers want to teach. Uh, and so the architecture needs to be responsive to that. If you design too particularly for one condition, it will need to change within five years or ten years. And so as the fashions change, the architecture needs to be responsive for that. There are, there are things about uh, children and how best they learn. They can't learn well in a, a very, very noisy environment all of the time. Uh, but they do, work, they do learn from each other as well as from their teacher. And so you want spaces that are behave well from an acoustic point of view, but allow for group work, for everybody looking to the teacher, flexibility in arrangements, uh, but good acoustics, good lighting, good ventilation, good access to external spaces, they are all really important for establishing good learning conditions for students. So there's not one particular type of building that works best, but there are certain architectural conditions we can design that can facilitate good learning. And that's what a school is about, is creating a great space for students to learn. You have follow-up question? Uh, no, no, that's uh, a very elaborate answer. I think, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Fabian. All right. Thank you. And um, is there any other question? Here, all right. Another question here, but the lady with the black hijab. Yeah. A lot of questions. They must be intrigued by your presentation. <laughs> all right, please state your name first and then um, followed by the question. Okay. Uh, hello, Miss Julie. I'm Tiara. So my question is, um around still around school so in indonesia there are some institutes that um combining uh preschool uh primary school junior high school and high school in one um building or one area so i'm i want to ask you uh, in your personal opinion or based on your research is that a good thing to do or is it a bad thing uh based on the integrity of the building or it uh, integrity of the inst institution? It's a hard question to answer because there are uh, school campuses in Australia that do that too, but the needs of very, very small children, infants, are very different to senior teenagers who are big I think of my son who's six foot four, I think of what he was when he was little, uh, very different. So often those campuses need to divide their areas so that the children play and socialise in their own groups so that they don't get uh, hurt by oh, big teenagers big. being too rough. Um, but we live in families which have people of all different ages in them. And it is good socialisation for students to be able to interact with people of all sorts of different ages. 
So it's a good thing, but it has some practicalities that sometimes make it more difficult to achieve well. Thank you for your explanation. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. Um, another question, probably. Okay, another question, lady with why? Sure. Uh, thank you, Miss Julie. Uh, I'm Danny. I'm from architecture. Uh, I want to ask, uh, based on your study uh, with the development of technology and IT right now, and actually in Indonesia, it's uh, already also integrated with the curriculum and the uh, system, education system in the school. Uh, based on your point of view, uh, will it affect the typology of the architecture of the school? Yes, thank you. I think it already is affecting the typology of the school because uh, we need to have space for laptop or devices like I have in front of me, uh, spaces that can be used for that, access to uh, um, power outlets, uh, so that people can charge their devices and make sure that they are useful. Overhead projectors. Uh, this all changes the shape of spaces so that people tend to either focus on the screen in front of them or the screen at the front of the classroom. That is not always the best way to learn. And so it, it causes some challenges Technology is something that we should be incorporating into our learning as students. Uh, it is a normal part of life, and so it's a normal part of schooling. But we need, as designers, to think about how that can be done cleverly and flexibly so that it does not become, it does not dictate exactly how the teaching will occur and the learning, uh, but it, is, it enables it when it is appropriate to do it. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Julie. All right. Thank you, Danny, uh, for the question. Do we have another question from the floor or from the Zoom? Pa, apakah ada? Belum. I still invite questions, yeah. Um, we still have time. Oh, 11. All right. So probably my final question from me, I began. Um, this is not uh, directly about the school. But I wonder, probably because we have so many research students here, uh, how do you categorize? How do you see all of the options of school and then make it a cap together as a category? What what do you base it on? And how do you, basically, how do you do research on this? <laughs> That's a great question. Thank you so much. Um, so... What we did, or what I did with this, is to have a lot of very little pictures of schools. And I got my wall in my office and I stuck them all up on the wall. And then I would start to look for patterns. So I would put them all in order of time. And then I would put them all in the order of style. And then I would look at the shape of the schools, the morphology of the schools, and I would categorise them in that way. And so I could start to see patterns. And then I would go and look up to see whether there were changes in the rules. So I could see, uh, for instance, at one point, schools suddenly had much bigger windows. And I was able to go back and look at the policy change that made that happen, but I could see it in the architecture first. And so that visual categorization, just being able to reposition things helps you understand something like this. And so it's a really useful technique. Uh, my students use it to do it with other buildings and that we, we look for these patterns and we can start to understand what is happening with the architecture. So one research technique being It's my mistake that we actually have time till 11.30, so we still have room for question if you still have one. If 
Do, do you still want to ask question? Probably. If not, then probably I will have another question for you, Julie. Sometimes um a student don't really understand how to reflect on history, like the history of schools, and they are feeling like they are in the contemporary state of the school that they are seeing, probably different with what you uh, explain. How do actually we, us as students, reflect on that and bring that idea or uh, knowledge to the current state in design? The great part about looking at history is that many times different ideas have been explored. And that means that you can look at examples and see whether they have worked or not. Uh, and so the more examples you look at, the more you can see where things have worked well, uh, and then you can be inspired by that and take those elements and incorporate it into new designs. So some of the experimentation that has gone on, particularly, say, in the 1960s in Australia, some of it worked really well and some of it did not work well at all. And what we see now are architects trying to do the same things. And you say, say, you need to know your history. This has been tried. It did not work. You need to have a different idea. Uh, and so that's what history tells us things uh, that can be very useful in contemporary design. Uh, but they can also uh, inspire us to new ideas, not the same idea, but a feeling that somebody was trying to create in a design. And you can look to create a similar feeling by using different ideas, uh, but it helps you understand. It also helps you understand that what you design speaks to people. <laughs> it speaks to the people using the building. It will speak to people in time. The decisions that you make have consequences for the people who use your buildings. All right. Um, thank you so much for the uh, answer, Julie. Last option. All right. We have another question over there. But, um... The man with the plates shirt over there. Yes. There. Uh, uh, hello, uh, I'm from Assistant Architecture. Uh, I'd like to ask you about uh, your opinion. Sorry, what's your name again? Uh, my name is uh, Iksan. Iksan. Yes. Right. Uh, as we see from nowadays phenomenon that we have uh, increase of density, so that what do you think about a school that is uh, placed on high build, high high rise building or a mixed use building that we could see that there's increasing in Jakarta right now that what which what, which category of school that that is uh, categorized and what do you think about that is it still like the same with the landed school and the uh, different places with the courtyard and we can, can we cannot see that in that kind of building uh, it's a really good question uh, the high rise school is becoming more popular more needed uh, as the land becomes more scarce what i worry about high rise schools is that sometimes they are hard to get uh, access to open spaces where students can spend time in nature, uh, outside, uh, playing, uh, doing sports, uh, as a co really connected thing to what they do in their school rooms. Uh, but it is possible to design spaces that allow for that. And of course, as uh, our external climate becomes less friendly to humans. Maybe we need to think about those spaces indoors uh, To, But as long as there are different spaces, if it is just like an office building with corridors and rooms, that is not enough for a school. They need to be flexible spaces that, that allow for different activities to, to take place. They are not just students sitting at a desk listening to a teacher it is more than that and so if they are designed well high-rise schools great if they are designed badly then they will not be good places do you have any follow-up question or 
Okay, uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Isan. Any other question? Anyone probably doing school for their final project? No? No question? Oh yeah, we have another question there. Fabian, right? Over there, with the head. Uh, hi, Miss Julie. It's me again. So, just out of sheer curiosity, uh, I would. Uh, I'm just. Um, I'm quite curious about what's the limit of you know. So Okay. Um. So, um, what's the limit of you know mixing typologies of buildings, right? So, we've seen a uh, school built in you know a, in the form of high rise buildings. Uh, but we also know that there's a need of natural spaces in there as well. And uh, I assume that it's not only limited to high-rise buildings, of course. So in your opinion, uh, what's the limit for, you know, the mixing and all these combinations of building topologies um, integrated with, uh, of course, uh, school, uh, you know, purposely school uh, built uh, buildings? I don't think there are very many limitations, except, of course, that schools need to have uh, the capacity to be healthy environments. And so if they are co-located with unhealthy environments, that may not be so good. You do not want school children getting sick because they are next door to uh, a chemical plant. Uh, but the co-location of different facilities with schools is quite interesting. And there is a history of combining then with welfare centres, uh, with um, libraries, uh, with all sorts of different community facilities. Uh, and that can be very beneficial for the school to have those co-locations. As long as you get the, the conditions right for the school, as I spoke about before, the acoustics, uh, the ventilation, the light, uh, a school can be anywhere. And in fact, there's a long history of schools being put in creative places because that's what the need was. And they were still places of learning and very effective ones. So it's only the limit of your imagination as long as the place is healthy for the students. Uh, and we can design it in many, many different ways, but uh, they do need to have some acoustic separation and ventilation and light and a healthy space in general. Thank you. Is that um, enough uh, or you have another? No, that's enough for me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Fabian. Um, other question probably from floor or in the Zoom? This is a rare opportunity to ask Julie Willis directly in person. All right, we have a question there. We still have another 15 minutes. <laughs> Hello, thank you, Professor Julie. Um, I'm I want to ask you. I'm not from What's your name again? Oh yes. My name is Aidafi. I'm not I'm not, I'm not from architecture, but I want to ask you. So from your presentation, I see that there are two influences, two different influences on the school architecture. Um, one is interested in facilitating learning and the other is external influences. So that is out of our control, like materials and the eras and war and growing population and everything um, and the scarcity of land. Mm -hmm. And so what I want to know is, and also you mentioned that there are architectural, architectural standards for schools that we can follow. But what do you think is the most important thing to consider to ensure that the well-being of the students and the ecosystem of learning is not sacrificed because of those external factors? Thank you. Uh, some of the external factors uh, are actually meaning that there are more schools that are ne needed. Uh, so as the rules have changed about how long a student needs to attend school, 
um, there, there become more demand for spaces as populations grow. Uh, so some of those factors um, are in the planning of schools, the, the future, future needs and making sure that there is enough space for schools to accommodate the students that they have coming to them. Uh, some of the factors are purely design factors. So if there is no material, one material is not available, another material will be found to create the school. It doesn't necessarily have an impact on the students learning immediately because uh, a space is created for them using different materials. But fundamentally, schools need to be safe spaces for students. Um, they have they have to be able to create an environment in which it is possible to learn. And so, if it is dangerous or uh, it does it can affect their health badly, these are things that we as designers need to make sure are not happening. So, it's, you're right about the two different types of impacts, but some of them. Um, are much more in the sort of planning and designing phase rather than affecting the student learning within spaces that are completed. Uh, and from an architectural point of view, that's why uh, I'm looking at the bigger picture rather than just what happens to the experience of a student in that classroom. Thank you. All right. Uh, the answer is why don't we All right. Uh, did I see someone want to ask also in this side? Yes, please. Don't forget to tell us your name first before the question. Hi, good afternoon, Professor Willis. Um, my name is Lea. I'm from uh, Architecture, Master Students. Um, I would like to ask you if you have any input or how we are as architects can contribute to push for good designs for state schools because I went to state schools all my life, basically. I, in particular, when I went to elementary school, my school was not well designed. And in, in Indonesia, we have basically two types of state schools. One we inherited from the Dutch, and then the second one we built ourselves. Um, and most of the time, the schools that we build ourselves are austere and utilitarian in nature, not from stylistic choice, but because out of necessity, because there are standards and bureaucracies and things like that that we, that we have to follow, and we don't have much budget and uh, things like that. So uh, what do you think on this? And do you have any experience in handling these projects? And what are your inputs? Thank you. I can say right now, I don't have experience in designing schools uh, that I built. That's not, I don't, that's not my area. Uh, but there are all sorts of reasons why uh, schools, the design of them, there's often not enough money and they need to be built very, very quickly. And so that means that there are particular choices that have to be made. And they need to uh, accommodate large populations of students over many, many years. So uh, they tend to be built for a long time. But as designers, we can make uh, we can make good solutions out of those conditions. Uh, and so, what we need to think about is flexibility. How, if they are going to be designed, how can they be renovated in the future? Will they be flexible enough in the size of the rooms, the floor to ceiling height, so that they can be refreshed in the future? Do they have enough access to, to light, uh, a natural light for that, for the students? Because that is good for them. The production of vitamin D makes you more awake and students need to be awake to learn. Um, we, can, we can do little things within constrained budgets and uh, regulations that make a big difference uh, to make better spaces. And better spaces mean better opportunities for learning. And so if whenever rules are written down, you can follow those rules precisely or you can follow those rules and do extra things. Mm -hmm. I think we should be following the rules and doing extra things wherever we can. Thank you. 
All right. So because I think the time is up, uh, we cannot say any more questions. We've got nine so far. That's awesome, right? All right. But unfortunately, we only have two souvenirs for the for the people who ask questions. So how can we choose? How can we choose? Um. So I have yes. Fabian well, is chosen. All right, and then the other one is. So the lucky one is Fabian and Tiara. <laughs> Can you get on the stage and Julie will give it to you right away, please. And then Kiara. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, we also have a certificate for Julie. Uh, and we would like to invite our Dean Ibu Sri Mariati to give the certificate. This is to express how grateful we are having Julie in here. Can we give them a plug? Thank you. And um, should we do photo say uh photo bersama nggak, Pak Fikri? Or nanti atau ditutup dulu atau ah foto dulu? Foto ah ditutup dulu aja. Ditutup dulu, abis itu baru foto. Probably Pak, Pak Fikri can capture anyone in Zoom also if ada. Um, in Zoom, we will do photo session. Um, 